We're on lesson 11. This morning we're going to be talking about Paul. Uh, I love Paul. <laughs> I love all the apostles. There's some that just really stand out and you can relate to. Uh, Paul should be first and foremost a reminder of the power of God to change a life. In three of the four Gospels, we have record of Jesus informing his disciples that with God, all things are possible. Not some things, not things that we think are possible, but all things are possible with God. Anything that's repeated in Scripture must have some greater significance. And the fact that this is recorded in three of the four Gospels, that all things are possible, is no exception. From the beginning of the account of Peter, he may have been outspoken and quick to jump to conclusions, but his desire was to find favor with God through the person of Jesus Christ. Now, I know I'm talking about Peter here, and this lesson's on Paul, because our introdu introduction to Saul shows quite a different opening chapter of his life to what we, and what we see. Not only did he oppose God through his service to the Jewish faith, he violently opposed God by persecuting his followers unto imprisonment and even death. Now, I can't imagine that this man was a disciple, or this man was someone who the disciples were lining up to witness to. No, they were doing all they could to avoid his wrath. Now, after Jesus' death in John chapter 20, verse 19, we read, the same day, speaking of his, uh, well, prior, just prior to the disciples knowing of his resurrection, being the first day of the week, the doors then were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Now, even though Saul may have not have been actively persecuting Christians at this particular time, the atmosphere which led to his rise to power among the, this Jewish movement was already well underway. The winds of change were blowing up a storm of persecution which would be led by Saul of Tarsus. This is why the disciples were in hiding. They already knew <laughs> that they weren't popular among their fellow Jews. The days of their open and relatively peaceful ministry alongside Jesus, they were over. Now imagine being the one whom God called on to reach out to Saul before his conversion. Now I'm grateful that we have an account of his, of, uh, his response to this calling from God. In Acts 9, 13, and 14 we read, once again, this is the one who God called on to to witness to Paul, who was then Saul, speaking out threatenings and slaughter. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. God had just told him to witness to Saul, and he was not keen on the idea. He knew why Saul was there. He knew the things that he had done up to that point, and he was not happy with the situation. This was not anything like what Ananias had planned for that day. But after a few words of encouragement from God, Ananias was on his way to find Saul of Tarsus. Now, I think that some of the most encouraging words in all of Scripture were spoken by this man. Now, I'm not talking about Paul. I'm talking about Ananias. Because to me, it was, when his encounter, his, the very first encounter he had with Saul of Tarsus, the very first words out of his mouth, Brother Saul. He called him brother. How much faith would it take for you to walk up to the most violent, hateful opposer of Christianity and call him a brother in Christ. Ananias' faith was so great that he could see the importance of, God call to act, of God's call to action and he responded accordingly. 
Saul's encounter with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus may have knocked him down, but it was this bold encounter with a fellow Jew that lifted him up to start on his faithful path, which would lead him all the way to Rome with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the commentary here this morning, Paul is arguably the most well-known of the apostles, and many have stated the desire to be as good a soldier as he was. While it is good to have someone who is worthy of imitating or looking to as a mentor of sorts, it must be remembered that the person's trials and tribulations are what made him the soldier that he is. Often people, they want to be like Paul. But how many want, how many are looking to be tried or persecuted like Paul? And when Ananias was called to witness to Saul of Tarsus, we read in Acts 9, 15 and 16 right after that, that we read earlier, but the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will shew him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now when Saul arose from God's healing touch through Ananias, God restored more than his physical sight. A spiritual vision of the truth was revealed to him that was so strong, it carried him throughout the rest of his life. Paul wrote in Philippians 3, 8 through 11, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, I've heard many claim a desire to know Jesus and the power of of his resurrection, Uh, repeating after Paul here, but they haven't yet counted all things loss. They have not yet been willing to count the things of this life loss. We cannot attain the fullness of this attitude that Paul had until we recognize that anything we may possess could be a hindrance to our service to God. And he may call on us to separate ourselves from it for our eternal benefit and for, the, and for the benefit of our ministry. Nothing in our lives should be able to hold us back from reaching God's perfect will. Jesus, when he speaks of this, he includes our closest family members in that list of things that we should not be willing to hold on to when God says it's time to let go. And we haven't even reached the part of the passage that Paul was speaking concerning Jesus' suffering and death. If people are unwilling to let go of stuff for the cause of Christ, what makes them think that persecution and death will be easier pills to swallow? Now, we need to remember that in order for us to experience the power of Jesus' resurrection, there's something very critical that has to take part first. If we want to experience the power of his resurrection, we first have to die. We cannot experience resurrection power unless we are already dead. There's no way around it. Clearly, Paul understood this since he gladly accepted his unpleasant demise after he had finished the course laid out for him by God. Are we as hungry to fulfill our mission? If we're truly the servants of God we claim to be, nothing in this life will hinder us either. There should be no cost too great to pay for the hope of eternal life in Christ. In Luke 14, 26 through 30, Jesus told his disciples, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me 
cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to build, finish it? Lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build, but was not able to finish. Have we counted the cost? Have we truly counted the cost of what it means to serve the Lord? In Golden Truth, 2 Timothy 3 and 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, I can't even read this verse without thinking that that word shall indicates a promise. It's a certainty. There's no ambiguity here. If we serve God faithfully, people are not going to like it. Now, that's not to say that we're, we're called to stir up trouble. That's not at all what it's saying. We are, call, we are not called to do our best to make others angry. But when our lives mirror the life of Christ, the response from the world will be similar to the response he had. Jesus never stirred up trouble among sinners or the lost in the streets. They were the ones who were most likely to receive him and accept the words that he was speaking. But he openly opposed the religious who should have known better. He called them out on their hypocrisy and their luxurious living at the cost of others. If we intend to reflect the life of Jesus, this will be seen in our attitudes toward open sinners and the religious hypocrites of our own time. This is what will begin to reveal the difference between the bride of Christ and the harlot church. I keep hearing people now talking about we're in the end of, end of time. We're quickly approaching. The signs of the time are upon us. And if that's the case, it won't be long before the harlot church is revealed for who she is and the church of God is revealed for who she is. We cannot side with heresy and claim God's will without falling among the deceived. This was at the center of both Jesus and Paul's ministries. And the results of their ministry speak for themselves. Paul wrote around half of the New Testament and ministered throughout the known world of his time. For those who were once opposed to Christianity, Paul's life stands out as one worthy of imitation. For those who came up in church, Paul stands out as an important reminder that we cannot begin to assume that we know God's plans for the future of the most vile and hateful of individuals. Either way, we would do well to recognize his sincerity in his service and strive for the same goal of perfection in Jesus by the power of the Spirit freely working through us. Remember Jesus' words in Matthew 6 and 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If we simply keep our eyes on him, God will take care of everything else. Lesson exposition, part one, truly furnished. 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 17. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions which came to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, Excuse me. which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. <clears throat> Excuse me. Paul lived a life that was transparent amongst the people of his time. His persecutions were not hidden. The doctrine he heralded and the victories he won in Christ were not hidden. 
Paul gave Timothy advice to continue in the Word of God, knowing that out, all, out of all of the persecutions Paul went through, God had delivered him. One of the most important things that a soldier learns is how to trust his fellow soldiers to fight with him. And should he be wounded, to get him the help needed to survive. We also need to understand that when Paul said, but out of them all the Lord delivered me, he clearly does not mean that he didn't have to suffer. Simply that the persecutions and afflictions did not permanently end his ministry. God knows what he's doing. And he knows exactly what it'll take to get each of us to where we need to be. He does this not only for our own sakes, but for the benefit of others as well. He knows who is watching, and he knows when. And God will utilize our difficulties and the way he helps us to endure them to be a witness to others, even when we don't have ministering on our minds. We simply must be sensitive to the Spirit and open to receive the instructions when he gives them. This is a perfect example of every faithful servant of God throughout time. And Paul is no exception. For the soldier of God, the most important point of trust must be in Christ and to believe that he can and will deliver the needed help. If the soldier is always worried about whether he will get hurt or whether persecution will come, then Satan will always have an avenue with which he can continue to torment the soldier. This is the reason that Paul was writing to Timothy. He desired to encourage him to settle his mind on the things of God. Paul wanted Timothy to know that a constant study of the Word of God would make him steadfast and strong in the fight against evil. Yeah. We, we need to realize that uh, Timothy, whom Paul stated, of course, uh, didn't have a book to stick under his arm and carry around. Right, right. They, uh, they heard the scripture in when they went to the synagogue. That's it. But in the home was the important part. Right. And uh, they only had scrolls mm -hmm. of the Old Testament prophets. And uh, so the biggest part of their study was memorization. Right. They had to memorize the word and they were taught this mm -hmm. in the home, not not at the synagogue. Right. They were taught in the home by their family. Mm -hmm. uh, we seem to feel like that we, we just leave it all to the church or to the school Sadly. or whatever. People make such a big deal of taking the Bible out of school, which I don't think is a good idea. <laughs> but probably a lot of the people that harped about that didn't teach them in the home either. Right. So, you know, we need to put things in the proper perspective. Absolutely. Uh, the study was very important and it, because it, the Word had to become part of them. They couldn't take a Bible and stick it in the pocket and go with them. They didn't have a, they didn't have a cell phone to yeah. put it on and pull right. it out any time. Right. It had to be in their heart, in their mind. Uh, I, that's, a, that's a wonderful and important, important point. I, I do want to take that and run with it just a little bit because it's none of us need to, need to believe, have, should have, the, have a belief that all we have to do is go to church and that the, the time that we spend in church will supply us with what we need. I, I believe that that time that those, those parents teaching their children the scripture at home was critical toward their upbringing. And I believe that those of us, uh, and I say those of us, meaning those, of, those who have, because I wasn't brought up in a house where the scripture was taught on a daily basis. Uh, I believe that this is a critical, critically important part of our spiritual upbringing. And when I say our spiritual upbringing, I'm talking about until the day we die. I'm not just talking about under our parents. Uh, well, I'm, I'm under my parents' roof, so I, I'm forced to do what they say. Our spiritual upbringing will continue until the day that we leave this earth. And so we can't begin to believe that a church service once or twice, three times a week is going to be enough. I know I've, I've pulled this out before, but how many of us would consider only eating three meals a week? Would you ever just say, well, I, I ate on Sunday. I don't need to eat again until Wednesday. 
Would you ever do that? I mean, there are times when God calls us to fast, absolutely. But would you just, eh, it's not important. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not, I'm not going to eat. I've got too many things to do. My life is too busy. I've got, I've got too much stuff going on. I just don't have time to eat. So I'm, just, I'm not going to eat but three meals a week. None of us, none of us would consider that. But how many of us, and, and I know that I've been guilty of the same thing, how many of us have said, well, I just, I got to the end of the day and I just didn't have time to read my Bible or pray today, so I'll just do it tomorrow. Uh, it, it wasn't that, it, I know it's important, but I just didn't have time. We would never do that with food. And the food just keeps us alive while we're here. The food in the Word of God will keep us alive through eternity yeah. if, if we're continuously being nourished by that Word. We need that daily sustenance that we receive from God's Word. We need that daily communication with God so that we can have an understanding of what it is that we're reading. And I believe, that as you brought out, this was a, this was a well-understood point at this point at this time in history when Paul was was writing to Timothy this was understood that this is something that's critical for our continued daily lives everything every day we should be focused on God first and foremost but we don't have that focus as a nation we certainly don't have that focus today and it's clear by the things that are going on in this nation that our focus as a nation, I'm not talking about anybody specifically in here, our focus as a nation is not on God. Our focus as a nation is on anything but God. Okay, well, I'll go to church on Sunday if I have to. But that, that's, that's more than I need. I, I know when, when Wendy and I first joined the church, I would get upset when, when the church would have a, oh, God forbid, like a, a convention, a state convention. I already went to church on Sunday. Why should I go on Friday night and all day Saturday and Sunday too? That's, uh, God only requires me to be at church on Sunday. I, God straightened me out, brother. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to go to church for convention. That's, that's, that's too much. God doesn't require me. All God requires is me to sit there and be quiet for two services on Sunday and one on Wednesday, and that's all my responsibility to God, and I don't have to worry about God the rest of the week, the rest of my time is my time. It did take my wife to straighten me out. God set me down and straightened me out. Uh, I, the very breath that I breathe, every time I breathe in and breathe out, every, every time my heart beats, that's God. Yeah. And that's what he requires. He doesn't require a tithe of my time. He requires all of my time. He doesn't require a tithe of my attention. He requires all of my attention. What was, uh, I, I wish I could think of that verse in its entirety and, and quote it perfectly, but it talks about you will find God when you seek him with all of your heart, not with some, well, I went to church on Sunday, that's enough. I read my Bible for five minutes today. I, 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 said, I said a little lame, and now I lay me down to sleep prayer before I went to bed, so I'm good. I prayed the Lord's Prayer. I prayed over my food at least twice this week. I'm good. That's not the way it works. Everything that we receive, every moment that we get to live is a gift of God. And we need to keep him first and foremost in our lives. And I believe it's clear from the account that we have of Paul that that's what he was doing. His focus was on God. His every attention was on God. How, how does my life represent God? Am I submitted to God enough that he can work freely through me to be a blessing to others, to help others? What is my life? Is my life a benefit to others, or is my life a hindrance that keeps them from fulfilling God's plan for their lives? This passage we're just reading here in the commentary, uh, one of the most powerful weapons the enemy of our soul uses against us is fear. Fear will keep us 
from doing God's will if we let it. Now, fear is not always some, a dread of some life-threatening situation. Sometimes fear can be as simple as the fear of speaking outside of our comfort zone. I was just speaking recently uh, to someone talking about teaching Sunday school. When I was called into the ministry of teaching, when I was called to teach Sunday school, I was not a teacher. I didn't have a desire to teach. I had no hunger to, to study God's word that I, like, like I have to do to get these lessons together. I had no desire for that. But God placed that in me. And now I, I, feel, I feel broken. I, I feel like something's missing when I don't have the opportunity to teach. That's not something I had before the calling was given to me. That's not something that I was, you know, when I grow up, I want to be a teacher. That was the furthest thing from my mind. I hate standing up in front of people. I, even, I hate being recorded. <laughs> this isn't, these are not the things that I wanted to do. But God placed that hunger in me. And he helped me to overcome that fear. Because his will is more important than my desire to sit back in the back of the church here with my wife. Those fears uh, could be the fear of making a certain decision. It, it could be a fear. Fear often will influence us far more than we would like to admit. Some of the things we may think, what if, what if I have to let go of something that's really important to me? What if God calls me to something that I'm uncomfortable with? How will this choice for God affect my financial stability? God is fully aware of both our own fears and the indiscriminate way our enemy spreads fear around, hoping to hinder our spiritual progress. All too often we focus on the situation rather than on the God who allowed us to come into that situation. It wasn't long ago I, I got a text on my phone and looked, and it was an image that Wendy had sent me. She sent me a picture of a cat sitting in a cat cage in a cat crate. Now, I don't know if any of you are familiar with cat crates. They've got the big bottom piece, and they've got the top piece, and they've got the little cage door that sits in the very front. Well, this cat sitting in this cage was sitting in the bottom part. The cage door was in front of him, but there was no top on the cage. And the cat was focused on that cage door, just looking at the cage door, just sitting, focused on the cage door. There's nothing on top. The cat could have stood up and walked out. But the cat was focused on that cage door. There's a door. I can't get out of here because there's a door and it's shut. And I don't have thumbs. I can't get out. Never even realizing that the whole cage wasn't there. The entire top part was gone. <laughs> Isn't that the way we respond to the things that God, the places where God allows us to come? All we see is this problem. God, I see this problem and I don't know what to do. Ask God. God knows where we are. He's allowed us to come to these places for a reason. And sometimes it, that's what it takes. Sometimes it, he has to place us in those situations to show us that he is God. He knows what's going on. And all we have to do is look to him for the easy solution. But so often we're too busy looking at the problem rather than being focused on God. We can't see the end of these trials when they come our way like God can. We can't see through the loss to the eternal benefits which lay just beyond our current pain. That's why when we're called, that's why we are called to walk by faith and not by sight. And that's why we have examples such as Paul to show us that the end will be worth our current perceived discomfort. Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians 4 and 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal 
weight of glory. Now Paul spoke of his own trials as light afflictions compared to the eternal reward that awaited him. He was able to say this because even though he could not physically see his reward, he knew by faith that God could not lie and that his reward would be worth far more than any earthly trial that he had to face. Ours will as well. We must simply trust God, just like Paul did. Part two, Paul's infirmity, 2 Corinthians 11, 22 through 30. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is offended, and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory in the things which concern mine infirmities. Paul, forced into an account of his infirmities, lists the troubles which he had gone through in his life for Christ. The gold nugget for the soldier here is that despite Paul's per personal resume in the flesh, he still found himself in trials, tribulations, and persecutions, just as all who serve Christ will. Now, when I say this, I say despite, I think, as a result of Paul's personal resume. We see the things he's gone through, and he went through those things because he was faithful to God. He was willing to suffer because he knew the end result. He knew the end result was going to be the benefit, the eternal benefit of the souls he was witnessing to, the souls he was ministering to. The most interesting part of this passage of Scripture is, the, is verse 30, where Paul says that he will glory in his infirmities. Paul was able to glory because he counted it a, it a blessing to be persecuted for Christ's sake. But why did he count it a blessing? Why would anyone count it a blessing to be persecuted? That doesn't seem like a reasonable thing to do. That's not logical. Until you remember what Jesus said in John 15, 19, and 20. He told his disciples, If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Paul's trials and persecutions and tribulations were indeed a gift from God. These difficulties, regardless of how painful they were to endure, were a manifest token of his faithfulness to God. They revealed to him, <clears throat> excuse me, they revealed to him that he must be doing something right or he wouldn't be facing so much persecution from the ones who should have been fully convinced of the same truth for themselves. The Jews held the Old Testament, which clearly foretold of Jesus and his ministry in many ways throughout its pages. Yet since they didn't recognize Jesus when he came, it's no wonder that they didn't recognize his followers. Paul was walking in the footsteps of Jesus, and every trial he endured reminded him that he was still on the right path. He was going to, in the proper direction in order to experience the power of the resurrection of Christ because he was walking in the fellowship of Jesus' sufferings. That's why he was able to rejoice in his sufferings. And if we are walking, walking godly in Christ Jesus, 
we will be able to do the same as, as well. All too often people of today want to be Christians until it's no longer popular. At this point they turn to something else so that they might fit in. We must understand that as Christians there will be times of suffering and persecution. We are no more immune to these times than were our forerunners. As a matter of fact, if we're not facing hardships as a direct result of our full surrender to God's will, then it may be time for us to reassess our commitment to God. This takes us back to our golden truth. If we're living godly in Christ Jesus, life will not be all sunshine and happiness as the world sees it. We will still have joy and peace as Paul did, but it will be in the midst of turmoil as others look on. Consider Jesus' words from Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 10 through 12. At this part, the people like kind of take out of the Sermon on the Mount. They don't want this in there. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely, that's important, falsely, for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And also his words from Luke 6 and 26, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers the false prophets. According to Jesus, it's not so great when people think highly of us. But when all they want to do is silence us, then it seems clear that we've probably found the mind of God. This is where Paul found himself as he suffered at the hands of those around him. And rather than being a hindrance or a, or a deterrent this spurred him on to be ever more faithful to the one who had called him out of darkness. The more he suffered, the more certain he was that those who would receive the truth were being positively motivated to action by God through his unyielding service to the Savior. This in turn should motivate us as modern day soldiers of the cross to press forward to perfection. Souls need salvation. And the only way that's going to happen is if they see us striving for the goal which has been set before us. <clears throat> Paul may have, been, may have been first among uh, a long line of trailblazers, but we need to take up where the previous generation is left off and press on toward the mark of spiritual perfection for the eternal benefit of souls. I praise the Lord for what has already been revealed. Praise the Lord for those spiritual trailblazers that we have who have, who have dug out the truths of God's Word and, and helped us to understand them and see them as we do. <clears throat> but God's not, <clears throat> excuse me, God's not finished with us yet. He still has more work for us to do. If He didn't, He would have already raptured His church away. As long as we are here, there is work to be done. It isn't God's will that any should perish, but it's up to us to show those lost souls the path to eternal life. This should be the ongoing effort of every soldier of God. <clears throat> Part 3, a great cloud of witnesses, Hebrews 12, 1 through 4. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. The author is telling the Hebrews to consider all those who had lived in faith and the great movements of God which were seen because of that faith, as a direct result of that faith. He said, seeing we also are compassed 
about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, to be, to be compassed about seems to indicate that we are being counted in among them since they apparently surround us. He is calling us to act accordingly. It has been said that people are known by the company that they keep. So if this cloud of witnesses surrounds us, we would do well to submit ourselves to the one who called us all together into this cloud for this important work. As Elisha, we have been chosen to take up the, the mantle of our forerunners. And only by closely following their examples to the very end will we receive that double portion of the Spirit which, which rested upon them. If we are lost, we are not lost unto ourselves. But our behavior will influence others to failure as well. And if we find hope in Jesus, that hope will shine forth, leading others to a saving knowledge of Jesus. As soldiers of the cross, cross we are called to action and not to retreat. While Paul may or may not have attended any of the Olympic Games, he is sure to have been familiar with them since they began in 76 B.C. and continued until approximately A.D. 393. One of the most common competitions in the games was a long-distance run, and since the winner gave bragging rights to his country, it was sure to have been a big deal to most of the citizens, even more so than the Olympics are today. Paul certainly understood that for an athlete to win his race, this race, he must put off everything that was unnecessary and run the race patiently since the distance was so great. <clears throat> he applied this same concept to the race <clears throat> we run as Christians, telling us to put off all sin and the things that slow us down, not just the sin, but also the things that slow us down. This is more than just sin, but rather anything that would slow us down in our attempt to fulfill the will of God. Now remember those things that had been gained to Paul, later he counted them as loss. To have them become a hindrance, to have them became a hindrance to gaining the prize he sought. They may not have been sins, but he found them slowing him down and keeping him from doing all that he knew, he knew that, he was need, that was needed to do. It may not be against the rules to run a race with a backpack on, but it will not work to your advantage if you intend to win. On this spiritual battlefield of life, there are also many things which may not be against our military regulations, so to speak. But if they keep us from rescuing the perishing, or if they allow the enemy an opportunity to sneak up on us, are they really that important for us to hang on to? If we cry out to God for the guidance we need, and then accept His words and do them, then the enemy will have no power over us. In addition, we'll find ourselves better equipped to recover those captives from our adversary as well. After all, isn't this the point of being a soldier for Christ? If, if you got saved because you didn't want to go to hell, that's, that's well and good. But as you grew in the Lord, you should have grown a desire to share what you had been given with others. Because the salvation experience is not simply something that we gain for ourselves but it's something that we should have a desire to share with others so that they have the opportunity to escape the torments that we wanted to escape when we first came to the altar in the first place. <clears throat> the conclusion, as soldiers in God's army, we must not be distracted by the things which come upon the outward man or by the fierceness of the battle. We cannot be defeated so long as we have the one true God on our side. God is has never lost a battle. And although some of the soldiers have received battles, <clears throat> although some of the soldiers have received battle scars, again remember, show me a soldier without so scars, and I'll show you a soldier who has not been in many battles. 
I praise the Lord for, for his willingness to reveal his truth through the ministers that we've had before us in our lives. I praise the Lord that God has given us those throughout Scripture who reveal the examples that both, both those examples that we need to follow and those examples that we need to avoid. <clears throat> God has shown us the way to go. He's given us the examples that we need. He's granted us his spirit to lead us and guide us into all truth if we'll accept the truth that he gives us. But we have to be willing, just as Paul was, to let go of some of those things, even if they're not sin, even, even if they're not a part of the 29 teachings or advice to members, or even if they're not something that, that is very clearly written down as something we should avoid. There may be things in, in my life that are a hindrance to me that would have no bearing on you. I have to be open and sensitive to God's Spirit when He points those out to me. And I can't say, well, God, so-and-so is doing it. Well, God, it doesn't say, this, this isn't a part of the Ten Commandments. This, I hadn't read this in the New Testament that I can or can't do this. We have to be open to the Spirit and submissive enough to understand when God speaks, it's our responsibility to listen and obey. And if we don't, we have nobody to blame but ourselves. Paul was faithful. And I pray that all of us will be as well. <clears throat>